Hello again. Today we're going to talk about time in music. Now, as I've said, music really is made out of time. Time is the stuff that it's made out of. It's sort of like the canvas upon which the composer paints, whatever kind of analogy you want to use. But I, I say we're going to talk about time in music because I, I want to just a little bit uh, present this slightly differently than the way the book does. What I'm, what I'm working from here is the section in the book, beginning on page 30 in the Canaan text, that starts with the big word rhythm. Right? Problem is that if I had written the book, I might do it a little bit differently. I would not start with the word rhythm, because rhythm is a specific thing, and the book treats it as both a general thing and a specific thing, and I find it personally a little bit contradictory and confusing. Now, once in a while I will do this. I will slightly quibble with the way the book presents something. Um, I think it's a very good textbook. Just a few things I would do a little bit differently, but um, by pointing out the difference, I think I can uh, maybe make it into sort of a little teachable moment, because it is a, it's a significant difference. But don't worry, I'm not going to try and like trip you up on the test because I define something one way and the book defines it the other way. Don't, don't get too hung up on that. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. Top of page 30, they start talking about rhythm, first with a couple of, of uh, paragraphs of kind of what I would call fluffy talk. Rhythm is basic to life. We see it in the cycle of night and day, the four seasons, the rise and fall of the tides. More personally, we feel rhythm as we breathe. We find it in our heartbeats and in our walking, and it goes on and on like this. Finally, the third paragraph down, they start to get down to nuts and bolts like a definition of what rhythm is. And you know I'm very big on definitions. It says here, rhythm forms the lifeblood of music, too. It is the flow of music through time. In music, rhythm refers to the ordered durations of sounds and silences. Well, uh, which is it exactly? Because they just defined rhythm in two different ways. They said rhythm is the flow of music through time, and then they said rhythm refers to the ordered durations of sounds and silences. That's not exactly the same thing. Um, now, probably what I would do if I was writing this book, I would start with just like time in music, and I might mention yet again that music flows through time. But rhythm is not really the flow of music through time. That's not how I understand it anyway. I understand rhythm to be a very specific thing. So for example, if I have a piano student come in and play something for me, and if I notice that she has played a rhythm incorrectly, like the rhythm that she's played is not the one that Mozart wrote or whatever, it's not just a matter of like, oh, I'm sorry, your music is not flowing through time correctly. It's a matter of something very specific, like you played this note at the wrong time, or you didn't hold it long enough, or you held this rest for too much time, or something. Right? Rhythm is a specific thing, and the second definition they give is closer to the definition that I would want to give you. It says uh, that rhythm refers to the ordered durations of sounds and silences. What I would add to that is, what I would say is that rhythm um, is the specific occurrence in time and duration in time of sounds and silences. Rhythm is the specific occurrence, like at this moment, but not this moment, not this moment over here. There's a specific moment when a sound or a silence occurs. Right? And this is something to keep in mind. In music which is written down, the silences have to be written down too, not just the sounds. Right? We have rests, which is a written-in silence. You can't just leave some blank space and assume it's going to be silence. You have to account for every nanosecond of time in a piece of music. It's either sound happening or silence is happening. You've got to write them both down. Anyway, it's the specific occurrence in time and also the duration. We have to notate exactly how long that sound or silence is going to be. And by the way, when I use the term notate, I'm talking about music that is written down by somebody. All right? And a lot of music, of course, isn't written down. 
uh, or at least it isn't written down before it is recorded or performed. Right? It's just kind of recorded or performed, and then later someone might come along and make an arrangement or make a transcription. But in that case, again, they would have to use rhythmic notation, and they would have to indicate exactly in time when every sound and every silence occurs, and for exactly how long those sounds and silences last. That's really what rhythm is. And that's a specific thing. So what I would like to do is present this same material in a slightly different way that moves from the general to the specific and moves from the sort of framework stuff to the actual kind of like paint on the canvas. Because just like in the visual arts, we have some part of the artwork which is like the frame, right? And then we have some that is what we think of as the art, like the paint right there on the canvas, right? So in the case of music, I do think it makes sense to start with the concept of the beat. That's what the book does. However, we have to keep in mind that music does not have to have a beat. Most music that we listen to does. Maybe all the music that you've ever listened to in your life had a beat. But you don't have to have a beat in order to have music. Right? And in fact, one of the earliest types of music that we will look at, like once we get through this unit into the next unit, uh, the first type of music we will study is Gregorian chant. And in Gregorian chant, there is no beat. There's sound, and it's organized, right? And it flows through time, but you cannot tap your foot to it, right? Now, this might seem kind of strange to you, music without a beat, but it exists. It's possible to have it. So a beat is not absolutely necessary. On the other hand, most music has a beat, so we might as well talk about music as if it has a beat. Right. We all know what a beat is. Right. It's kind of like the simplest way uh, we could mark time. Um, and certainly in, in the music that you listen to, the beat occurs at some steady rate. Okay. And this is the next thing to talk about. Again, I would present this material a little bit differently. What the book should do is they should talk about beat and then talk about tempo, because tempo is the speed of the beat. Now, what, what the book does is they talk about beat, then they talk about meter, and they talk about accent and syncopation, and only then do they get around to tempo. I think this is a mistake. Um, I think it'll be clearer if you understand. Okay, let's say we have a beat. That beat is going to be either faster or slower. That's what the tempo is. It's simply the speed of the beat. Assuming that the beat is at a regular speed, like maybe one beat every second, two beats every second, right? That's the tempo, the speed of the beat. Now, uh, the tempo is maybe the single most important thing about any given piece of music. That is, if it has a beat, right, and if those beats are occurring at some regular speed, the speed of the beat, I would argue, is the most fundamental, maybe the most important thing if I had to single out any one thing, maybe the most important thing about any piece of music. That's obviously a pretty bold statement to make, but I think it's true and I'll, I'll try and prove my point. Imagine that you and a friend are both big fans of some particular musician, pop star. Let's say it's Bruno Mars, okay? And let's say Bruno Mars just came out with a new song and you have heard this song, but your friend hasn't. And you're going to try and describe this song to your friend. Like, oh, did you hear the new Bruno Mars song? No, I haven't. What's it like? Of course, what you would do is you would just take out your phone and you'd find it. And... But let's say you didn't have a phone that could just conjure up out of thin air the latest Bruno Mars song. Let's say you had to describe it to your friend in words. How would you start to describe it? You would probably make some reference to the speed of the beat, the tempo. You would probably say something like, oh, it's up-tempo, it's like you could dance to it. Or you'd say, it's slow, it's a mellow ballad, something like that. You would probably start your description with some reference to the tempo, the speed of the beat. Because this is the first thing we perceive, right? It's what creates the mood more than anything else, right? In a similar way, we could say that um, if you go to an art gallery to look at paintings, now, you might, not, uh, you might not get this same sense looking at, if you're taking an art class and you're looking at paintings in a book, 
and they're all made about the same size so that they fit in the book, you don't have any idea of when you go to an actual art gallery and you see the original painting, and you see, for example, some of these self-portraits of Van Gogh are quite small. And something like, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware uh, is, is huge, right? And that's the thing that, that you, that, that's impressed upon you first, is the sheer size of this painting or the smallness of the painting, right? You can't help but be struck by that first, right? And remember, what space is to the visual arts, time is to music. So the first thing we perceive is, does it seem to be moving faster or slower through time? And it's the beat, of course, that, that gives you that perception. Of course, time itself moves at the same speed. It's our perception, which could be slower or faster, depending on events like beats that are happening in time. Okay, so tempo is hugely important. In fact, it's so important, and again, I'm going to prove my statement that tempo is maybe the most important thing about a piece of music. In a piece of music that is written down by a composer, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, the very first thing they write, before they write any notes, the very first thing they indicate, the first thing they tell the performer is the tempo. All right? And they will use... One of these words, which I'm about to run through here, one of these Italian words, remember Italian is the language of music. Um, also, by the way, while I'm on that subject, in music, like you know, classical music, that has to be interpreted by a performer. So if I'm, let's say, playing something by Mozart, I have to pay particular attention to Mozart's tempo marking, and I might listen to other pianists um, and try and and I might either be convinced by their tempo or I might disagree with their tempo. Tempo is something that musicians are very particular and fussy about because if you get it wrong, even by just a little bit, then the whole mood is wrong somehow. And it's something that, for example, if I'm playing with other musicians, we have to agree on the tempo. It's always the first thing we talk about. What's your tempo, right? And sometimes, you know, classical musicians have uh, sharp disagreements about the, what, what the correct tempo should be. And those have to be resolved, or you just probably won't be able to, to play with each other. Right? And we are very opinionated about tempo. We hear a Beethoven's fifth that's a little too slow or a little too fast. Like, ah, too slow. You know? And we, we kind of don't even want to hear the rest of it. If it's too slow right off the bat, why should I waste my time? This guy obviously doesn't understand Beethoven's fifth. You know? So we're very opinionated about it. It's because it's that important to us. Okay. And as you'll see, there are many, many different words for different tempos, or actually even different words for the same tempo, because these Italian words that describe tempos are telling you more than just the tempo, they're telling you the mood. And remember, the tempo determines the mood. The tempo and the mood are like this, they're inseparable. So each of these words, which I'm gonna try and relate to you, you know, they're in Italian, they're in a foreign language. I'm going to try and make the connection to English so that they have significance to you, right? This is the way you should learn foreign words. You should try and connect them to words that you already know in English. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you the, the translation of these and try and find similar words in English. So I'm over here on page 32, and they give 10 tempo markings. Um, and these are not the only 10. There are many, many more. They're just giving you kind of like the basic 10 tempo markings. And they're listed from slow to fast. The slowest one that's listed here is largo. L-A-R-G-O. And they define that, they translate that, they say very slow, broad. Actually, largo, we can think of something that is broad, something that is large. That's what it literally means in Italian. Largo is large. There's just one letter of difference. So when you see largo, you think of something that is slow because it is large, like an ocean liner moving through the, you know, through the sea, not in a, very, in a particular hurry, you know, moving majestically with great dignity. That's what largo means. Now here's another kind of slow. Grave also means very slow. What's the difference? Well, grave has a different emotional overtone to it. Grave means grave, same exact spelling, meaning like the situation is grave, like it's serious, it's solemn. 
A funeral march is almost always marked grave, right? And that tells you, ooh, this is serious business. It's something probably sad and gloomy. So that's different from something being slow simply because it's large, something slow because it's sad, right? And here's another one, adagio also means slow. Um, the literal translation for adagio in Italian is at ease. Ad agio means at ease. So this means basically just we're not in a particular hurry, right? We're at ease. The piece might be uh, sad. It might be, let's say, uh, and not necessarily sad, but just kind of mellow or contemplative or introspective or what have you. Um, but it's at ease. It's not in any particular hurry. Next tempo they have here is andante. Andante literally means walking in Italian, so walking speed. Now, you might think that's a little vague, right? I mean, people walk at different speeds. Yeah, and, and that vagueness is probably deliberate. Most composers want to leave a little bit of leeway, you know, so they don't indicate, for example, most composers don't indicate a precise number. It's possible to do this. Some composers will say something like 100 beats per minute. That's the tempo of this piece. But most composers traditionally did not do that. They uh, wrote one of these tempo markings, which gives mood as well as tempo and is open to a certain amount of inter interpretation. Um, moderato, moderate tempo, neither too fast nor too slow. Uh, the next one is allegretto, but in order to explain allegretto, I need to jump over that one and go to allegro. Allegro is a very important tempo marking. The literal translation of that word, allegro, means cheerfully. And, yeah, we, we interpret that to mean fast. Remember, it's in the same way that, for example, forte in dynamic markings, forte does not literally mean loud, it means strong. But, you know, we if we're going to play something strongly, it kind of implies that uh, it's going to be loud. And if we're going to play something cheerfully, it implies that the tempo is going to be fast. Now, Allegro is a very useful tempo because this is one case where, like classical musicians, people who are going to be playing music where something like Allegro is going to be written into the music, um, we all kind of have an understanding of pretty much exactly how fast Allegro is. Allegro is one tempo marking that really does correspond to a pretty specific number, and that number is 2 beats per second, or 120 beats per minute. And it just so happens that that is the speed of a march. When you hear a march being played, that's allegro. Right? And once we know that tempo, we can kind of base all of our others off of that one. Right? So if we know that allegro is about 120, then moderato is going to be something less than that, and vivace is going to be something faster than that. Here, by the way, is uh, you, can, you can easily come up with Allegro. All you have to do is think of a, a clock and just beat like 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. You just have to beat twice for every tick of the second hand on a clock, right? And think of a march, like Okay, so uh, some of you might recognize that as The Stars and Stripes Forever by John Philip Sousa. Notice what happens if I change the tempo. If I go too much faster than that or too much slower than that, the mood of that march is ruined. Especially if I go too slow. Well, look what happens if I go too slow. Like if I go something like 100 beats per minute instead of 120. It's more like... Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. It's, it, it's lacking energy. You think of the march of like senior citizens, you know, through the mall with their walkers. Um, on the other hand, if we go too fast, that also kind of ruins it. If, if it's like... Now it's kind of lost a certain amount of dignity. It sounds trivial. It sounds like we're in a hurry to get somewhere. Not like a marching army, you know, more like a retreating army. Uh, we don't want that either. So we got to get the tempo just right if we're going to get the mood, if we're going to 
If we're going to be convincing to the audience that we are playing this piece the right way, the tempo is the single most important thing, I think. Uh, anyway, moving on. If we take E-T-T-O and we stick it on the end of an Italian word, we get basically a little, whatever that word is. So allegretto means a little allegro. It's not quite full-fledged allegro. It's a little allegro, so somewhat fast, but not quite absolutely fast. That's kind of the opposite, by the way. Remember, isimo? This isimo on the end of the word means extremely. So pianissimo means extremely soft. Fortissimo means extremely loud. So etto has kind of the opposite function of isimo. Uh, okay, next one, vivace. Okay, this is a word we can connect to the English language because if you've ever known someone who is vivacious, <coughs> who is full of life, that viva, right? That viva means life or live, right? In any like romance language, that's the that's the root. So vivace means lively and it implies a faster tempo and allegro. Presto, that's a word that we might hear once in a while. I want that done presto, very fast. Prestissimo, very very fast. That's as fast as probably we can go, um, because it's extremely the isimo. Now, composers also sometimes add further sort of qualifiers or descriptors to those basic tempo markings. So, for example, if I want to go on uh, allegro, but I don't want to go too fast, I might say something like um, allegro ma non troppo, meaning allegro but not too much. Or I might say something like allegro maestoso, which means uh, allegro but majestically. Maestoso means majestic. Um, if I want to go a little bit faster than allegro, maybe not quite vivace, but a little faster than allegro, I might, I might uh, write something like allegro molto, meaning very allegro. Molto means kind of like much, much allegro. Or I might say something like uh, allegro con molto, allegro with motion, or allegro con brio, Allegro with brio. There's no real English word for brio. It's sort of like gusto, uh, with energy, with drive, whatever. Um, so, composers are very specific about tempo. Again, re-emphasizing how important it is. Occasionally, the, the, the tempo might increase or decrease. That is, the speed of the beat might get faster or slower in a piece of music. Uh, an increase in the tempo is called an accelerando. Makes sense, right? It's just the Italian version of our word accelerate, accelerando. The opposite is ritardando, right? Uh, it comes from that the root T-A-R-D, which means late or slow, right? Um, ritardando means slowing down the tempo. This is something, by the way, that doesn't happen too much in popular music. Usually, in a piece of popular music, the beat stays the same, you know, it's established at the beginning, and it stays the same tempo throughout a piece of music. That is not the case in all classical music. Tempo is often treated more flexibly in classical music. There are places where you speed up, places where you slow down. Okay, so um, now they, they also mention that the metronome. The metronome is just a device that gives the precise number of beats uh, per minute. And you might have seen someone like practicing the piano and there's a metronome, the old fashioned metronome. Uh, has this you know, back and forth motion. Nowadays, you can, you can download a metronome app on your phone for free. Um, you can buy a metronome and it just ticks at some speed. There might be a knob on it and you set it at 120 and it ticks exactly 120 times every minute. All right, now having talked about beat and tempo, now let's go back and talk about meter. And all these things, by the way, you, you probably had no problem with the concept of beat and tempo. It's pretty simple. Uh, meter might be a little bit trickier for you, but um, as with many of the different aspects of, I guess what we're talking about here is music theory. You all understand more music theory than you might be aware of. And you might say, well, I never played an instrument. I don't know any of this stuff. I can't read music but you've all listened to music your entire lives. 
So you've internalized, you understand music theory, you just don't know the terminology for it. I'm teaching you the terminology. I'm kind of like teaching you a lot of stuff that you already know, but you just didn't know the words for it. You didn't know the theory, right? Not at a conscious level, at a, at a deep sort of subconscious level. In the same way that by the time you went to kindergarten, you already understood a lot about the English language because you could use it. You could have conversations with adults. You could make yourself understood. and Other people, you know, uh, could tell you something and you could understand them. Why? You know, nobody told, your parents probably didn't teach you the English language by saying, this is a noun, this is a verb, this is how you conjugate, this is how you make things agree in, in tense or in number. Uh, you learn that stuff later. You know, no one was probably having you diagram sentences before you went into, into kindergarten. But you understood the logic of the language. You internalized it as you listened to your parents speaking, as you listened to your brothers and sisters. So that by the time you went to kindergarten, you actually knew quite a, a lot about language. You might maybe have uh, heard about what a noun or a verb or an adjective is yet, but you've been using those and you understood internally what those were. Right? Similarly in music, some of the things I'm going to talk about it might seem confusing at first, it might seem new, but this is all stuff that you've experienced over and over again every time you listen to music. Okay, So let's take meter, for example. Here's the definition of meter. Meter is the arrangement of beats into units, which are called measures, sometimes called bars, and the way that we arrange beats into these units called measures is by having an implied um, emphasis on certain beats and not others. Right? An implied emphasis. Now, at this point, and this is probably something I should have said earlier, uh, when you talk about rhythm or tempo or beats, you might have in mind percussion instruments that are actually beating out the beat for you so that you, it's very clear where the beat is because that's the kind of music you probably listen to. Music that has at least a drum machine or a drummer, right? So I want to just, just make clear that you don't have to have someone actually pounding out the beats on a drum in order to have rhythm, in order to have meter, in order to have a beat. The beat can be implied, right? Um, Here's what I mean by that. If you, uh, if you listen to, for example, when we get to music of the Renaissance, okay, mostly vocal music, there's no drums, there's nobody pounding out the beat, but you could still uh, possibly, you know, snap your finger to it or conduct it. You could feel it, but it's very subtle. It's in the background. It's sort of like, it's part of the framework of the picture. It's there, but it's, it's not calling attention to itself. It's not so obvious that someone looking at the painting would be like, wow, look at that frame, you know? Uh, now, other kinds of music, uh, for various stylistic reasons, does put the beat front and center in your face. And that's, that's certainly the case with rock music. Uh, that's just part of the style. With rock and pop, uh, the beat is much more obvious and it's it's put right out there in your face, usually by a percussionist. That is not the case in all music. You can have beat and, and rhythm and all that without percussion. So for now, I just kind of want you to separate, you know, when, when if I start talking about beat or rhythm, just kind of don't think about percussion instruments yet, okay? Think of them as sort of an abstract concepts for a little while. Um, so for example, uh, arranging beats into measures. Uh, we do this by emphasizing certain beats. How do we emphasize them? Well, it's kind of tricky to explain, but if I demonstrate it for you, I'm just going to emphasize them by playing those beats louder than others. So, for example, let's go back to my beat uh, at a tempo of 120, right? So far, there's no meter because I'm not emphasizing any of the beats. I'm trying to bang them all out more or less equally. But if I emphasize every other beat, then we would have what's called a duple meter, like Now, notice my tempo is staying the same, but I'm establishing a meter. Now, let's take that meter away. Go back to just meterless beats. 
Now, you might still be perceiving it in twos and like duple meter because it's kind of left over there in your brain. But what if I change it to a triple meter? I'm going to emphasize every third beat like this. Now I'm going to take that away. I'm going to go back to duple. This is like the meter of a march. We only have two feet. We have a left, right, left, right. Okay. Take it away. And now back to triple meter. One, two, three. One, two, three. We might think of a waltz. Like, uh, I'm going to speed up the tempo. Da, 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 da. So, same tempo, same speed of the beat, but different meter. Uh, now, where do meters come from? Why do we have this concept of meter in music? Two main important sources, and one of them I've already just kind of alluded to. Notice how I, I said that a waltz is always in triple meter. A waltz is always in triple meter because that's the dance step, right? Uh, and a lot of the meters that we have in music, particularly in instrumental music, come from dance. And that those, those metrical patterns existed in the dance step. And then when you have to when you play the music that people are dancing to, the meter of the music has to correspond to the meter of the dance. Right? We will see, when we start talking about instrumental music, we will see that all, really the, the earliest type of instrumental music which was written down was dance music. Right? So instrumental music is very much rooted in dance, and so the meters that we have um, for instrumental music are often related to dance. And, and remember also that until very recently, right, just the last, I don't know, a few decades really, dance steps were very specific and it wasn't a matter of just like learning some funky moves and going out on the dance floor and moving around and everybody doing their own thing. No, you had to learn specific steps and everybody did them in a coordinated way. And if you didn't do them correctly or if you didn't know them, you would make a fool of yourself. You'd be stepping on people's toes. No one would invite you to another ball ever again. And that would be very bad for you because dancing was a very important social activity. Right? So these dance steps, all educated people, all cultured people knew these dance steps. They actually danced them. And so as these patterns made their way into music, they, were, they had a sort of a, a cultural resonance and association with people. Okay? Now, the other source, the other main source of meter in music is from language, specifically from poetry, because a lot of vocal music is simply... Poetry set to music. Now, this is especially the case in, quote-unquote, classical music. Um, when a classical composer wrote a song, they did not usually write the words. In almost every case, they took the words of a poet and set those words to music. They provided the notes, but a poet provided the words. And until fairly recently in human history, poetry always had a meter. That was part of what poetry was. Today, when you think about poetry, you might think about words that rhyme, although rhyme now is optional in poetry, has been for a long time. You can read a lot of poetry that doesn't rhyme. Or you might think, well, it's words that are very flowery and descriptive. Um, yeah, but what people understood for a very long time, what people understood poetry to be was verse. That is, Words that have a certain metrical pattern, right? And there are certain poetic meters, just the same way that there are certain meters in music, like duple meter, triple meter, quadruple meter. There are certain poetic meters. I'm going to demonstrate this to you by reading probably the best-known sonnet by William Shakespeare. This is Sonnet 18, and it is in a certain meter, which you might have heard of before. It's called iambic pentameter. Okay, let me read it first, and then I'll talk about iambic pentameter. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, 
and often is his gold complexion dim, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou show'st. Nor shall death brag thou wander at his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou grow'st, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay, I might not have gotten all that right. It's tiny print and my eyes don't work good anymore. But the point is, well, where was the meter? Right? Did you hear beats in there? Well, poetic meter isn't quite exactly the same as musical meter, but it's very much related. In poetic meter, instead of beats, we have syllables, and those syllables can be stressed or unstressed, and we will have a certain number of stressed and unstressed syllables in a given line of poetry, and that's the meter. So, for example, iambic pentameter. This is when we have five, that's the penta part, five iambs for every line of poetry. What the heck is an iamb? An iamb is a metrical foot. It's a metrical unit consisting of an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. And in every line of this sonnet, there are five of these units, which means Shakespeare had to think about not just the meaning of the words and whether they rhyme, but whether they fit in the meter that he's established. Whether the stresses fall at the right place or not, whether they're the right number of syllables or not. Right? Now, all of this is kind of in the background. It's not meant to be in your face, right? but it's there. Let me, let me demonstrate. I'm going to read it over again, and I'm going to emphasize the meter. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaf hath all too short a date. Okay. Now, obviously, now there you could see, you could probably hear the five unstressed you know, the five units of unstressed followed by stressed. But it sounds ridiculous if I read it that way. That's not what Shakespeare intended, right? For some to say, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, right? There, I, I'm taking something that is supposed to be in the background and I'm shoving it in your face. That's not what Shakespeare intended. In the case of this sonnet, and I think most uh, verse, what the, what the, author is intending is for you to feel an interesting tension between the meter and the rhythm. Because the rhythm is not the same thing as the meter. The rhythm is more like the way I would actually pronounce these words. When the sounds would happen in time, what would their relationship be to each other in terms of their length? Where might there be little silences? Like, here's how I would more naturally read it. The rhythm of how I might read it would be something like this. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Right? There's a certain rhythm there. Right? That's the rhythm. It's a separate thing from the meter. And what's interesting is when the, the rhythm and the meter are not lined up exactly, but are kind of like in some tension with, with each other. Okay, um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because I'm talking about rhythm. Let, let me backtrack a little bit. So I've talked about beat, tempo, talked about meter. I gave an example of duple meter and triple meter. Right. By the way, we have, uh, if you watch a conductor, now not all conductors will do this um, because sometimes you watch a conductor and they're just kind of gesturing and making, you know, faces. But um, if you watch a conductor who is using the specific beat patterns for each of these meters, you can see uh, where the strong beats are, where the weak beats are. So, for example, in duple meter, the correct conducting pattern that every music student learns is you have a downbeat followed by an upbeat. So you just have to make two motions, a down and an up. And the down is the strong beat, the up is the weak beat. 
strong, weak, strong, weak. Da 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 dum bum 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 bum. Okay. In a triple meter, it's like this: down, out, up, down, out, up, down. Da 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 da. Okay. Quadruple meter, you have four beats. Now quadruple is a little different because you have a down beat, the strongest beat. Then you have a weak beat. And then you have another strong beat. Now it's strong, but not as strong as the down beat. Down beat is always the strongest beat. The first beat in each measure is always the strongest beat. And then you have an up beat. So it's down, in, out, up. Strong, weak, strong, weak. Strongest, weak, strong, weak. All right? And that's, that's how we conduct quadruple meter. Now there are other meters that are possible. You could have measures with five beats, six beats, seven beats. That's much less common, however. The most common meters are two, three, and four. Duple, triple, and quadruple. Here's an exception of, a, of an unusual, what we might call an irregular meter. The Mission Impossible theme is in five. Right? There are five beats in every measure. But even there, I think it's arguable that we don't really perceive five beats. We, we perceive two followed by three, or three followed by two. I think our brains are just kind of hardwired to have a hard time dealing with meters that contain more than four beats. We are just naturally going to perceive either two, three, or four if we're perceiving a meter. Um, now remember, of course, meter is something that is optional, right? If beat is optional, in other words, we can have a piece of music that doesn't have a beat. It's possible to have that. It might be uncommon, but it's possible. It's also possible to have music that does not have a meter. It's just unusual. Probably most of the music you've ever listened to in your life is in quadruple meter, because that's just part of the style of pop, rock, right? Very unusual to find a rock song in triple meter. You might hear some progressive rock songs, prog rock, that use some unusual time signatures like Rush, for example, or Genesis, some of these prog rock bands from the 70s and 80s did use. That was part of the progressive idea. Now, like, let's not stick to the same old stuff. Let's experiment. Let's do different, unexpected things. All right. um, okay, so that's meter for you. Now, we can talk about rhythm, really. Okay, rhythm in that specific sense of the exact occurrence and duration of sounds and silences, okay? So beat, tempo, meter, all those things are kind of like the framework for the art, right? So if we're talking about an art that happens in time, not in space. In other words, if a composer is deciding to write a piece of music, they might first decide, okay, well, how long or how short of a piece might it be? And how fast or how slow is the beat going to be? What mood is it going to have? What meter am I going to have? Should it be in duple meter, triple meter, quadruple meter? And at the beginning of the piece of music, they will indicate with something called a time signature or a meter signature that indicates uh, how many beats there are in a measure. But having done all those things, they haven't actually written in any notes yet. Those are all things that are sort of establishing the framework. Once I start writing in notes, like I'm going to have a sound here, another sound there, a silence in between, and then some more sounds, some notes, whatever. Now we are talking rhythm because we have sounds that are happening against that framework. And those sounds are going to happen at certain times and not others. And they're going to last for a certain amount of time and cease, and then there will be a different sound or a silence or whatever. So now we're really getting into rhythm, the actual occurrence and duration of sounds and silences. So um, let's, let's kind of tie all this together. Uh, and I'm going to use, again, the Stars and Stripes Forever to demonstrate this. Uh, let's say I'm John Philip Sousa, and I'm composing the Stars and Stripes Forever. First of all, well, if it's going to be a march, it's got to be allegro, it's got to be about two beats per second because that's the correct march tempo. And it's got to be in duple meter because we got two feet left and right. So that takes care of the tempo and the meter. Okay, so that's the framework. But I haven't, notice we haven't had any notes yet. Okay, 
Okay. Once the notes start happening, like once the piece actually begins, what do you hear? The rhythm. And I'm going to have the rhythm in my right hand. The beat and the meter is in my left hand, and that's going to be a certain tempo. The rhythm, completely different thing, is in my right hand. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So uh, now I haven't I haven't added any pitches yet. There's no notes there. They're just rhythms. I'm just banging on this ottoman in front of me. Once I add pitches, then I've got a melody, and that will come in a future lecture. Right? But I think you could because I already sang it. You could kind of tell what the what the melody is, even though all I had was just the rhythm of the melody and not the pitches. And in doing this, I, I kind of want to emphasize again that these are different things, like beat, tempo, meter, rhythm. Problem is that very often people kind of talk about these things in a kind of a casual way and they don't make those distinctions, especially non-musicians. And it's not a big deal. It's just, you know, people say things like, for example, I really like Latin jazz because I like all those fast rhythms. No. Rhythms are not fast or slow. There's no such thing as a fast rhythm. The same exact rhythm can be played fast or slow. Rhythms aren't fast or slow. Tempos are fast or slow. Okay? So these are separate things, and I'm being kind of picky because it's my job and I'm a professor, and so I get into the nitty-gritty. But we should understand these things as separate because obviously, you know, for no other reason, there are going to be questions on the test about them. And even though these are related things, they aren't the exact same thing. So we need to be able to make distinctions between beat and tempo and meter and rhythm. Okay, And I hope I've done that for you. If not, please send me a question. Because again, I understand some of this stuff might be confusing, like the difference between meter and rhythm. All right? So if I haven't explained it well enough here, Please send me an email and I'll try and do a better job. <laughs> uh, one last thing I'm going to conclude with here. The next unit is on uh, music notation. And I am going to talk about music notation, but I, I'm just going to let you know right now, don't worry about, like, do I need to be able to read music? Are there going to be questions on the test, like, tell me what note this is or tell me what rhythm this is. No, I'm not going to expect you to be able to read music, but I do want you to know some of the principles of how music is read or how it's notated. So remember, notation is simply the writing down of anything. When you're taking notes, you're writing something down. Uh, music notation is how music is written down for people to read it. And this is the only way that music could be preserved or recorded before the beginning of recording technology, you know, like about 100 and 120, 130 years ago. Right? Up until very recently, of course, the only way you could record music or preserve it was to write it down. So you had to have some system of music notation. Now, the system that I'm going to talk about next time, the familiar, you know, the five lines and the little dots and the squiggles and all that stuff, um, that's not the only possible system. That's just the system we have now. It evolved over a long period of time. But why don't you read about that stuff for next time? We'll talk about music notation, both the pitches, that's like the, the notes that are high and low and all that, and also the rhythmic aspect of it. Um, and then we'll get into talking about fun stuff like melody and harmony and form. Okay, so we'll see you next time.